thank our co-sponsors who were instrumental in helping bring Kelsey the phenomenal new book, The Keeper to Campus, the Gender Studies Program, the Creative Writing Program, and the Painting and, and, Painting and Drawing in the Art Department. There was a time when drawing and writing were not separated for you. In fact, our ability to write could only come from our willingness and inclination to draw. In the beginning of our writing and reading lives, we drew the letters of our name. The motions, e the motions each required hadn't become automatic yet. There was a lot of variability of shape, order, and orientation. The letters were characters, and when certain characters went together in certain order, they spelled your name. And that's the introduction to Linda Berry's Making Comics. While the book's called Making Comics, I wish the true title were the words that's written above it on the cover hand-eye celestial activity. This is true about the act of creation in its art, the physical making of art, but also the process, a process that's shrouded in a little mystery. Kelsey has spoken about the act of drawing every day and how that started her on a steady movement towards the keeper. We see that in the DNA of her last book, The Bitter Life of Bojna Nemkova, a biographical collage. But it's in the keeper that we see the true marriage of this kind of hot eye, hand, celestial activity. In her essay, The Fiction Writer in His Country, in her book, Mystery and Manners, Flannery O'Connor says, in the greatest fiction, the writer's moral sense coincides with his dramatic sense. And I see no way for it to do this unless his moral judgment is part of the very act of seeing. And he's free to use it. I've heard it said that belief in Christian dogma is a hindrance to the writer. But I myself have found nothing further from the truth. Actually, it frees the storyteller to observe. It is not a set of rules which fixes what he sees in the world. It affects his writing primarily by guaranteeing his respect for mystery. I find I return to O'Connor often as I think about the act of creating, the ways in which it is both mystery and a distillation of the way a writer sees and understands the world. The artist takes what they see, what they hear, and experience and turn it into art. Linda Berry has her writing and drawing students write daily in their notebooks because this form of practice, quote, makes us begin to notice we notice something. This is something we need to do, not just as writers and artists, but as people, to spend time noticing the world, to be in it fully without distraction. It is how we make moral judgments. But it's not just judgment, but observation, that, that looking is a source of artistic discovery, even as we mine the depths of our own experience. But creative nonfiction is tricky business. On the one hand, you have the challenge and the thrill of turning real life into art. But on the other hand, you have to deal with all the issues that come attached with that real life. In his book, Wonder Book, Jeff Man Vandermeer articulates how creative play functions as communication. When unburdened by the need to put words on a page, the imagination often appears as a form of love and sharing, playful, generous, and transformative. The best fiction is often driven by this invisible engine, which hums and purrs and sighs. It's this flicker or flutter at the heart of good stories that animates them, and this movement, ever different, ever unpredictable, that makes each story unique. But what is that flutter, that mystery? Vandermeer argues that it wasn't until the Renaissance that imagination becomes linked to intellect in the Conte Philosophique. These stories use fantasy to explain the Copernican universe. And while we may not always rely on stories anymore to explain the world, we are hardwired to understand, use narrative to understand each other. It's why reading is a practice of empathy. Researchers have discovered that words describing motion also stimulate regions of the brain distinct from language processing areas. The brain, it seems, does not make much of a distinction between reading about an experience and encountering it in real life. In each case, the same neurological regions are stimulated. As we read The Keeper, a, story, a, a coming of age story, not just about playing soccer, not just about Title IX, not just about being a woman, we understand Kelsey's story and life and we have an empathetic experience in what Publishers Weekly has called a work of disarming emotional power. I was getting angry, Irving writes. I was finding my voice. It is that voice that propels the book. The artist, the athlete, the writer, the mother, the teacher, the wife. Irvick is all of these things and of none of them. She asks us to consider what it means to be marginalized and what it means to be free. She asks us to consider our privi privilege, our rigid classification of genders. She asks us to engage in her understanding of the, wor of the world as a way to understand herself. 
The Keeper is a book about mystery, the mystery of the multiple selves that are a part of each of us. It's a book that considers how experience and books and fate can help us understand the world. It is learning to write and draw your own name. Kelsey Urbick is the author of the graphic memoir, The Keeper, but also three previous award-winning books of fiction and nonfiction, The Bitter Life of Bozna Nemkova, Lillian Balcony, and For Sale by Honor. She's also the co-editor with Tom Hart of the forthcoming The Field Guide to Graphic Literature, which will be out from Rose Metal Press this year sometime. I guess, I hope she'll tell us when. Her work has also appeared in The Rumpus, The Believer, The Washington Post, Lit Hub, Colorado Review, <coughs> Passages North, and Quarterly West. She's received grants from the Indiana Arts Commission, the Sustainable Arts Foundation, and New Frontiers in Arts and Humanities at Indiana University, where she teaches. Um, please join me in welcoming I don't need this, but I'm going to use it. Okay. I, I feel like Dion's voice is carrying more than I thought it would, but um, so that's great. Um, I get all caught up in Dion's like essayistic intros, and I'm like, ah, oh, yes, Flannery O'Connor, tell me more about Linda Berry. Um, so I'm like, oh, right, now it's my turn. Um, so um, yeah, thank you for that. That was that was really cool. And Flannery O'Connor was actually also a cartoonist, um, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, thanks to the many sponsors um, in the gender studies and fine arts, and of course the creative writing program at Notre Dame. Thank you, Dion, for organizing all this. Thank you, Paul, for. Uh, getting me organized here, getting the poster, like a really cool poster. I love that design, I'm gonna steal one on the way out. Um, so tonight I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna do kind of two things. I'm gonna read from the book and then I'm gonna also kind of follow that with a short version of like an artist's talk where I, um, because I think of myself, and Dion's alluded to this in her intro, I think of myself as a very unlikely graphic memoirist and so, in, so after I read from my graphic memoir, I'm going to talk a little bit about that journey and how I came to be one, and, um, and even a little bit about my um, processes and how I put the book together. Um, so um, The Keeper, as Dion alluded to, is about many things. It's about uh, growing up in girls' sports in the early years of Title IX, and Title IX, if you don't know, just celebrated its 50th anniversary last year. Uh, it was signed into law in 1972. It is the law that prohibits sex discrimination in educational institutions. And it's best known for uh, ruining football for you know, college men across the country. Um, Notre Dame was actually one of the big uh, anti-Title IX fighters in the 70s, as you can imagine. Um, so I was one of the early beneficiaries of Title IX, and, um, and I've been talking a lot about that in some of my other talks and stuff that I've done for the book. Um, but uh, the, the Keeper is also about my journey from being a young girl athlete to becoming a writer and artist, and it's something that I, I've, I've kind of always saw those worlds as very different, sports and literature, and when I was a young girl athlete, it was just never a given that I was gonna grow up to be a writer or artist, even if I, you know, sort of wanted to be, but I just, it, it just didn't, it didn't seem like that was me because I was, you know, a sporty girl. So I'm gonna, um, I wanna talk tonight as, as, as I, and kind of think about the keeper, not so much from the Title IX sports side, although there will be some of that, um, but as the keeper as a Kunstler Roman. Some of you, I'm sure, know what that word means, but some of you might not. I, I, I wrote a blurb for a book a couple years ago, and I called it a Kunstler Roman, and the author was very happy with everything I said about her book, and then like two months later, I saw her at AWP, and she was like, thank you again. I had to look up what a Kunstler Roman is. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, sorry about that. And I had it like three times in the review, because I was like getting pretty passionate. Um, so does anybody want to does anybody want to share what a Kunstler Roman is? Or know what it is? Or do you know what a Bildungsroman is? 
What's that? Coming of age story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Bildung Zerman is the coming of age story, right. And a Kunstlerman is a subcategory of that, which is the coming of age of the artist. So Bildungs, from the German, um, like education or formation, roman, novel or story. Kunstler is the artist. Um, so a, a novel of an artist. Um, so th this is not a novel, but what the heck, we still call everything graphic a graphic novel anyway, so people don't really differentiate between fiction and non. Um, so I want to think about the keeper as, um, as a Kunstler Roman. Okay, so um, going back to um, me being a goalkeeper and like thinking about my future, um, I was, let's see, I, I turned to, as I'm thinking about this connection between uh, goalkeeping or sports and art, um, I'm turning to, and in this drawing here of myself, which is not in the book, this is just like a separate little thing I drew, um, I'm reading Vladimir Nabokov's Speak Memory. And in Speak Memory, Nabokov talks about the fact that he too was a goalkeeper. And this is a quote from a very young uh, Nabokov who says, I was crazy about goalkeeping. That gallant art had always been surrounded with a halo of singular glamour. <laughs> Classic. And then this is actually an epigraph to the book, um, also from Nabokov. Another line he says in Speak Memory is, I was less the keeper of a soccer goal than the keeper of a secret. And um, of course his secret as I talk about later in the book, is uh, his secret was that he was a writer, that he would stand back in the goal while all the action is down at the other end, and he would compose poems, and you know, it, it can get kind of boring being a goalkeeper. You're just like, <laughs> you spend a lot of time by yourself. So, um, so yes, he was the keeper of a secret. Um, and this is from a page in the book because um, Albert Camus was also a goalkeeper. So I talk about some of these writers who were goalkeepers and I'd say, like Nabokov and Camus, I was a goalkeeper who wanted to be a writer. Unlike them, I was a girl. So, um, yeah, so I want to think about that young girl who, who like kind of, you know, like has a sensibility, like I like, I like reading, I like writing. Um, I know that other people do that, but I am also like a sports girl. So, um, so again, coming back to this idea of thinking about the keeper as a Kunstler Roman, and this is just a, again, not in the book, but a sketch of my um, current office where I do my little, do my writing and drawing. All right, so there's the cover and table of contents. And I'm gonna read um, a bit from the first chapter and then like another chapter and then I'm gonna kind of like move around a little bit. Some of this stuff I haven't read before because I'm kind of piecing together some of these like artist threads. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so this is from chapter one, The Creation of the Girls. Everyone knows how birds are created. Less is known about how birds become girls. Our flock came from the banks of the Ohio River. As with all girls, our wings were removed. Or did they fall off? But we were given special gifts that few girls had before, and we had to learn how to use them. Mr. Ryan's video begins with a still shot, one of dozens of team photos we'll take over the years. Our uniforms have sashes, like we're all Miss America. I'm in the middle in blue, the keeper. Our team was the 1971 Cardinals, named for Ohio State Bird and the year we were all born. We spent the 1980s traveling in a flock to soccer tournaments. A flock of Cardinals is called a radiance, and we were radiant. Every tournament we touched turned to gold. Mr. Ryan, a cyborg in cutoff jeans, recorded it all. In 1987, we competed in the US Girls Nationals Tournament in Seattle. I was 16. My hair suffered from a combination of hairspray and sun in. Seattle was as far from Ohio as I'd ever been. 
The top four teams in the country were there, California, Texas, New York, and us, Ohio. Everything was fancy. My teammates and I felt important because people other than Mr. Ryan filmed our games and interviewed us two at a time. Who will be the first to get pregnant, they asked. Who will be the first to get married? Who will have the most kids? Um, these are the questions they asked the best girls soccer players in the nation. Not one of us said, are these the same questions you asked the boys teams? Maybe the questions weren't so far off. One of my teammates got pregnant the next year and another the year after that. I was about to start dating the guy I would eventually marry and divorce. Most of us became teachers, nurses, stay-at-home moms. It makes me wonder, can different questions conjure different futures? So what if they had asked, who will be the first to play in the US Women's National Team? How many gold medals do you want to win? Who will be the first woman president? But in 1987, there was no Women's World Cup no women's soccer in the Olympics. We'd never heard of a women's national team, and we still haven't had a woman president. Okay, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do two more slides that follow, but I wanna call attention on here to um, the hands that are uh, holding on to kind of like, you know, a, um, a magic, what do you call those? Like a glass, when you read into the glass, Crystal ball. Crystal ball, yes, yeah, crystal ball. I was like the glass ball. I don't think that's right. Okay, so yeah, my hands, um, but they're in like perfect goalkeeper W formation, and I and I have a lot of images throughout the book of like hands in that form and thinking about hands like um, typing stories and um, and hands holding my baby, my dog. I mean, she's not a baby anymore. Um, but so I'm thinking of hands as kind of um, related to sports, but also to like making, art making, to child raising, um, and of course also a little bit to this kind of crystal ball magic. So this is from, um, the next two slides are from, an excerpt from the next chapter. In my early goalie days, I was still 30 years away from getting a tattoo of Leonora Carrington's sculpture, The Palmist, with its magical hands. It reminds me of the power of women and art. These days, I'm a writer and a professor, and my life is quiet, focused on books, art, and teaching. It's easy to feel far away from that girl on the soccer field. But looking back now, I wonder, if I could have looked into my teenage goalkeeper palms, what would I have seen in my future? What would I have told myself? Okay, um, now I'm going to read chapter three. This is called A Boy's Life, so now I'm going back actually to when I was even younger and um, my very sporty days. Growing up, I had a boy's life or at least that's how I think of it now. I was the first one, the first girl, picked for gym teams. I could throw a perfect spiral. I kicked home runs in cul-de-sac kickball. And here I am on the cover of our local magazine playing soccer with boys. But occasionally I would be reminded that I was, in fact, smile, a girl. And that there were differences between being a boy and being a girl. When I started school, I was given a keepsake book to record my activities and store mementos. I learned that one difference between boys and girls is that girls get depicted bending over <laughs> with their bloomers showing. <laughs> Another difference is what boys and girls got to be when they grew up. Each year, the school day's book asked me to choose. Um, and I, since you probably can't see it, um, so each year is like first grade, second grade. It's, it's the same list every time. And I'm gonna go over here because it's really small on my computer. But the boys could choose to be um, astronaut, football player, baseball player, hockey player, chef, fireman, policeman, soldier, cowboy, 
or artist. <laughs> um, girls could be mother, nurse, teacher, actress, singer, model, secretary, biologist, <laughs> artist, or air hostess. So, and that's all in this, this book that I had. So every year I was like choosing again. So in first grade, at first I didn't distinguish between boys and girls' careers. And I chose um, baseball player, policeman, and mother, like all <laughs> six-year-old girls. Um, in second grade, I even added an other that would surely not have belonged, or that surely would have belonged on the boys' side, um, and that's soccer. But why did a second grade girl in the 1970s choose so many sports? When I was born, my dad was still in college where he had just finished his final season of Division I football. He hoped for a boy, and he raised me like a boy. He taught me to throw a football, hit a baseball, and shoot a basketball. And that's me and, as a baby with my dad and his graduation from college photo. <laughs> In kindergarten, I got the best gift, a New York Giants uniform with full pads. I felt so powerful in it. My parents signed me up for soccer when I was in first grade. My mom still recalls my dad cheering me on. Atta girl, draw blood. <laughs> there weren't any girls teams then, so I played on co-ed teams, and my dad bought a book to learn the game and become our coach. No pain, no gain, kids. No guts, no glory. I was tall and strong, as good as the boys, but by third grade, it seems I had learned that I was a girl and to limit my choices accordingly. So I chose mother, teacher, actress, and artist. The only thing both boys and girls could be was artist. In second, third, and fourth grades, I wanted to be an artist, a girl artist. I wonder what I thought that meant. I didn't know any artists the way I knew mothers, teachers, and secretaries. I just knew I liked to draw. In fourth and fifth grades, I also wanted to be a biologist. I'd been given a butterfly collecting kit, and my preferred quarry was tiger swallowtails, abundant in my Pennsylvania yard. I didn't know that young Vladimir Nabokov had been a lepidopterist, a butterfly hunter. <laughs> um, in his memoir, Speak Memory, Nabokov describes a swallowtail as, quote, a splendid pale yellow creature with black blotches, blue crenels, and a cinnabar eye spot above each chrome-rimmed black tail. But perhaps what most appealed to me was their resemblance to the black and gold uniforms of the Pittsburgh Steelers and Pirates in what was, in the late 1970s, the city of champions. Like many sporty girls, my heroes were usually male athletes. Oh, how I wanted to be like Lynn Swan, the graceful and gravity-defying wide receiver for the Pittsburgh Steelers. As if his name wasn't elegant enough, he was also a ballet dancer. In fourth grade, I wrote and scratched out soccer. In fifth grade, I did the same with athlete, so both on like the bottom. I think of what Virginia Woolf said of her sister Vanessa Bell, quote, once I saw her scrawl on a black door when I am a famous painter, and then turned shy and rubbed it out. So that's Vanessa Bell, Virginia's sister, who did become a famous painter. But why did she write and then erase her dreams why did I? Did I too turn shy? I was a shy kid. Did I look around and notice there were no grown-up women soccer players? And this is a quote from Bell Hooks. Those of us who are not fantasizing about a white wedding or the man of our dreams knew we were freaks. We knew better than to speak our longings. Or had I already learned, as I learned to keep my dreams on the girl's side, not to speak my longings? But Bell Hooks was born in the 1950s. I was born in the 1970s. Weren't things different? While I recall wanting to be a football player or baseball player, I have no recollection of wanting to be a policeman, which I checked off in first and second grades. There can only be one explanation. <laughs> Charlie's Angels debuted in 1976, and my sister and I watched every episode, collected trading cards, and played Charlie's Angels. 
We had matching water guns shaped like the ones the angels had. We raided our mom's purse collection to conceal our weapons in style. And we patrolled the house in search of bad guys. The angels had trained with the LAPD. I didn't want to be a policeman. I wanted to be an angel. The point is, things were changing. Girls were seeing smart, strong women, smart women, working women. The feminist movement had caused a shift. But as the saying goes, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And those are, of course, all the same women. That's Jacqueline Smith as um, Kelly Jackson from the from Charlie's Angels on the left, and Wonder Woman in the middle, Diana Prince in the top middle with her glasses, and then, you know, sexy Wonder Woman. And then the Anjali commercial, which I will not sing, and if you know it, you know it, and I'm just gonna leave it there. <laughs> Maybe it's no surprise that by sixth grade, there was only one thing I wanted to be when I grew up, and that was a model. So, that was the end of that. Okay, uh, I was also 5'8", so I mean, what's a 5'8", 6th grader gonna do? Um, so, I'm gonna just kinda like leap forward to, um, I ended up playing soccer. Uh, I, I played all through high school and then I played for Xavier University. Um, our top uh, conference rival in those years was um, the University of Notre Dame, that's right. Um, so, I, I played, we played against Notre Dame out here on the field. That was the only time I'd been to South Bend was to play Notre Dame before I came up here and had a job interview many <laughs> years later. So here I am. Um, I just thought I would throw this, I'm kind of skipping most of that chapter, but I do say, just because I think this gives a good visual of like, I mean, this is like sport girls life. That's obviously me back middle. Um, but when I was a student athlete at Xavier, I was, I, I was the only student athlete who was also an English major, and my bookish life always seemed at odds with my jock life. Um, but don't worry, Nabokov felt the same way. <laughs> he said, the literary set frowned upon various things I went in for, such as entomology, practical jokes, girls, and <laughs> especially <laughs> athletics. <laughs> So, okay, so I'm gonna leap again to after, so, so once I graduate from college, I mean, I'm a, I'm a girl athlete. There's nowhere to go, there's nothing to do. There are no sports for girls after college um, then. It's changing now. Um, so I became a teacher and a coach. And, um, and so here I am in like my early 20s reflecting on like what's next for me and starting to like think about um, an artist's life. So, um, I, I just on, I mean, I'm kind of picking up, on the left, I was picking up from a previous page, but, but I want to read it here because I think it's important to say too. Soccer in the U.S. was white. Um, after emerging in working class immigrant communities, it took root in white middle class suburbs where families could afford equipment and travel and where there was access to land for fields. And then I quote Brianna Scurry, who's um, a black goalkeeper um, for the U.S. Women's National Team. She's my age. I played against her one time in college, um, but she went on to be like the, the like, save the penalty kick in the World Cup, you know, famous Brianna Scurry from the 1999 World Cup. Um, but she says uh, soccer was not an option for a lot of African American kids. She said that in 2017, highlighting the inequities that have persisted for decades. One of the reasons it was an option for me was because our family lived in the suburbs. Um, so then I'm kind of looking off here to saying, with my soccer days behind me, I was beginning to long for something more than, as Virginia Woolf described it, the suffocating and aesthetic of the suburbs. At the time, I believed a person could be an athlete or an artist, but not both, and that it was decided for you somehow like the way, or so I've been told, Soviet officials decided who would be an Olympian and in what sport. You will be athlete. <laughs> what can I say? I was a Cold War kid. But I wasn't an athlete anymore, and now I was ready to be something else. I didn't know how to be an artist or a writer, but I knew how to be a student, so I signed up for some community education classes and learned new ways of using my hands. 
And in my own version of bibliotherapy, I bought a copy of The Artist's Way. I started a new journal dedicated to the daily morning pages and to answering weekly prompts. In week one, when asked to identify, quote, enemies to creative growth, my answer, sports. <laughs> Back then, I believed that all the time that I devoted to sports had kept me from pursuing other interests. I worked through the first few weeks with feverish excitement. By week two, I was already envisioning quitting my teaching job and going to, grad to art school. By week three, Paul and I, my husband, visited art schools and I was calculating finances to figure out if I could afford it. Week four, I quit my job. And I write on the side, that's from like my actual journal. I did it. As I read that journal now, I can feel the excitement in those pages, a new future forming, but it wouldn't be the future I expected. Week five, I'm quoting from my journal here, really tired, feeling barfy, wave of nausea. nausea. <laughs> Week six, I'm pregnant. So, so I didn't go to art school. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, so I, I had my daughter and when she was three, I, um, I did go to grad, so yeah, so I found this right. So I went to grad school when she was three, so now I'm just gonna read a little bit from my grad school chapter, so this is for all you people in grad school. Anybody in grad school? <laughs> all right, football is important. So I continued writing my morning pages, um, imagining a different future for myself. And as a 29-year-old mother of a toddler, I quit my job for good this time, and I went to graduate school in creative writing. As a keeper, I was accustomed to feeling like an outsider, but in grad school, as the only mother of a young child, I often felt like I was leading two different lives. In one life, I workshopped stories, uh, wrote long papers with long titles on a tangerine iMac, and <laughs> had lunch with my literary idols. I put Lori Moore, but there were a lot of them. In my other life, I was homeroom mom. And there's my daughter like, mom, and I'm bringing donuts in. Are those for us? Birthday mom, Chuck E. Cheese. And I suppose it was inevitable, soccer mom. So those are just scenes of me like, when you're a soccer mom, it's like you're coaching the team. I, I was coaching the team. I was, you know, running all the practices. I was ordering the medals. I ended up taking the photos of the team. It was, it was a lot. In 1928, Virginia Woolf delivered the lectures that became a room of one's own, which argues that patriarchal structures limit women's potential. I underlined and annotated my copy. In both life and literature, she says, quote, the masculine values prevail. Football and sports are important. The worship of fashion, trivial. This is an important book, the critic assumes, because it deals with war. This is an insignificant book because it deals with the feelings of women in a drawing room. And that's a picture of Virginia Woolf and um, her sister Vanessa Bell playing cricket when they were younger. But oh, Virginia, I was guilty. I too believed that sports, that football was important. Sports were important. I'd learned that my whole life. My life as a woman and mother, on the other hand, often felt trivial and insignificant. Women's work. All my writing professors were men and I wanted to write like them and the male writers that I and they so admired. I was more like Nabokov than I ever knew. And so here's Nabokov writing a letter to Edmund Wilson saying, I am prejudiced, in fact, against all women writers. <laughs> and yet it was becoming clear that the words of women writers spoke to me most directly. They spoke of unlimited desire and ambition in limited and separate spheres. They spoke of motherhood as something to be valued, of the kitchen as a space of creativity and community, of their words as a source of power. They spoke of sisterhood and the bonds of women, they spoke of injustice, resistance, of revolution. I don't know why I thought it was so different being an athlete and an artist. An athlete who is a woman has more in common with an artist who is a woman than an athlete who is a man. There is no reason why, by fo why football should not be played by women. The masculine values prevail. 
Women are not the, quote, ornamental and useless creatures men have pictured. I don't have time to be anyone's muse. We want equal pay. So these are all figures that have come up at different points in the book. Um, lady footballers, Leonore Carrington. Um, I was getting angry. I was finding my voice. Okay, so that's the um, end of, of reading, and now I want to kind of transition from like leaving off from grad school. So I'm, I'm getting angry. I'm finding my voice. What am I writing or doing? And, um, and, and so this is um, just like a really brief overview. I had a piece of paper I was going to be reading for. Okay, but that's okay. Um, anyway, so these are, these are my first two books, and basically, the point is I started like writing short stories um, set at Chuck E. Cheese Pizzeria, um, <laughs> of baby showers, of you know bad boyfriends, um, women's stories, and then um, my book Lily on's Balcony is set at Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water, and it's you know there's a lot of white space, but there's it's all text, there's not images. Um, but when I took a tour of Falling Water, um, I was really struck to learn about Lillian Kaufman. And um, she, her husband and her son and Frank Lloyd Wright were very involved in the you know, making of, they commissioned Falling Water from Frank Lloyd Wright, but, and she did too. And what I was struck by was how little she showed up in the histories of Falling Water. She was always put into the you know, margins or just left out entirely, and so, um, so just early on, I was starting to write stories about um, women, about um, historical figures that we, that I thought we should know more about, that I, I wanted to know more about, and there wasn't information there. Um, these books are also fiction, um, so they, I was imagining things in my, in my next book. Oh, and then, okay, yes, this is the transition to my next book. And then I started reading. Um, Dion quoted Linda Berry on the top right. I started reading Myra Coleman, um, poetry comics. I, I started reading uh, Fun Home by Alison Bechtel, reading books that were like all image and text, and I just got like kind of dazzled. I was like, wait, you can do this? Like, you know, I grew, like comics when I was growing up was like very much a, a boy's world, you know? I, I liked the Sunday cartoons, the funnies. Um, but I never really got into comics and comic books, but I, I, I was always interested in visual art and suddenly I'm like, I'm like, oh my gosh, wait, these people are writing like really substantial, beautiful stories like with drawings and I, I don't know, I just didn't know I could do it and, or that it could be done. So um, what did you, I forget how you phrase this book as like my transitional point or something, it was a perfect <laughs> word. Um, but anyway, so my next book, um, also about a historical woman that like uh, is a Czech, she's a Czech fairy tale writer, like Czechoslovakian. Um, and basically the first novelist um, in Bohemia and Milan Kundera calls her the mother of Czech prose, but I bet you've never heard of her. Um, so anyway, this book, was a lot of um, found texts by and about her that I arranged, and then I wrote her a series of postcards. So there's plenty of text, but then I um, had been creating visual artwork, and the book was accepted on the text, and then I talked to the publisher, and they allowed me to like add in some of my images. So now I'm like, oh, so I can add my own images into stuff? Um, so um, final few slides here. I decided I wanted to transition from just having like a few of my images to like writing a whole book um, and um, a, you know something a graphic novel memoir whatever and um, and so I basically like put myself on a another PhD um, another like training course to figure out how to do such a thing and um, I've I learned from getting a PhD really as much as I learned in my classes and everything I learned that you learn from doing right. And Dion alluded to me um, starting doing like a drawing or painting every day, and so that was I, in 2018. I decided that's what I'm doing. I'm gonna I'm gonna learn how to draw and paint from drawing and painting. I also took little classes on the side to help me do it better, but I just started doing it every day. And at the end of 2018, I published an essay in the Rumpus that I'm gonna share from you, share with you a little excerpt. 
where I pair some of the artwork that I made with, you know, just sort of, I'm asking the question, like, what happens, um, hold on, what happens when you commit to painting or any form of creating every day for a year? So I'm just going to take you through a few of these really quickly. I can't see this. You exist in the world differently. You see objects and shapes and colors in ways you've never seen before. You make things you never imagined making. You read differently. You misread, it actually said Saunders, not sadness. <laughs> you think differently about writing, words by Milan Kundera. And obviously that last one came up soon, or too soon, but you think about art differently and poetry, and some of you were there, this Eileen Miles came to Notre Dame and I was, I was there and drew that after that. And sports. And this essay goes on with many ways in which I began to think differently in, in art that I made that year. Um, and this was 2018, the last World Cup, and I got a little crush on the Croatian goalkeeper. Um, but that kind of brought me back to thinking about my own goalkeeper days, and this page from the book where I say I probably wouldn't have chosen to be a keeper, but I can't imagine a position more suited to me. Um, so then, I, and, and actually along the, along the way too, I, I made a bunch of like short form comics that I published at the Rumpus and that was this big, I was like on a deadline to do them every couple of weeks. Um, I did a series called Welcome to South Bend um, when uh, Mayor Pete was running for president. Um, and I did a, a, a series um, called Suffragette City when um, leading up to acknowledge the, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. So. So, and then I was like working on this longer, you know, my own story. Um, so, this is a photo I took right before I came here tonight of my desk, so you can see what a mess it is, but I think it gives you a little like, I, I have like my writing section over here and then like my messy painting section, but I just wanted to like, I don't know, show you that. These are some of the, um, like, some of the images that you just saw, like, are in here. Oh, so this is like from 2018 when I was starting to do art every day. Here's me saying happy birthday to Virginia Woolf, because I'm apparently always thinking about Virginia Woolf. Um, but anyway, so I'll, I'll leave them out if you want to like go through them. But here's that bowling picture. This is from Chippewa Lanes. We're on a bowling team, bowling league. Um, and so there's just, you know, so this is where I was doing a lot of this work. I'm just kind of trying to figure things out. And um, so anyway, you're welcome to look at those. With, my, with the book, with the keeper itself, I ended up, I did some work with like watercolor or gouache um, or acrylic, um, but I, um, I had to get it all into my iPad. Um, I, because I don't know what I'm doing and I've kind of taught myself, I just do everything on my iPad. I know people are really good at like Illustrator and Photoshop and I'm not, but here's Procreate. It's a $10 app that you can download <laughs> and my entire book is on it. And so these are like all my little, um, you know, folders and like here's my entire, the entire book of the keeper. And I had a subs folder, um, like I just call it subs, like my substitutes, you know, classic like sports metaphor, where I put all my rejects from the keeper, like I would be working on something, I'd be like, oh, this isn't gonna work, I'm gonna dump it over there. Um, and, you know, I've got kind of like my little daily stuff, I've got my Rumpus comics in here, um, but you can, like, I click on the keeper, that's the whole book. <laughs> Um, so I had to get all everything, even if it was like manual, I had to get it into this digital format. Then it goes into InDesign, etc. Um, anyway, I thought I would just share a little bit of that. And the very, very last slide is to give you a preview of um, my next book that's coming out that Dion alluded to. And this is one I've been editing because the other thing, as part of my little secret PhD program for learning how to do comics, was that I decided to edit a book on making graphic literature and basically 
like got all of my favorite comics artists and graphic narratives makers um, to write essays about how they do their work and to have examples of it. So the Field Guide to Graphic Literature is coming out in July and I'm gonna, actually just today was the cover reveal, so it's not even a secret anymore, but you'll be among the first to see the cover. Um, so this is the cover. So subtitled, artists and writers creating graphic narratives, poetry, comics, and literary collage. I'm working with Tom Hart, who is an amazing, long established um, cartoonist, and um, he has an amazing graphic memoir <clears throat> called Rosalie Lightning. Um, sorry for some stuff over here, but here are some of the um, contributors and um, Naoko Fujimoto, who's actually one of my former students at IOSB. She does graphic poetry, Nick uh, Potter, Nick Francis Potter, um, Mira Jacob, T. Bui, Bianca Stone. It's amazing. It's going to be full color. Rosemount Press has a series of books, The Field Guide to um, Flash Fiction, Prose Poetry, Flash Nonfiction. So this is coming out um, in July. I'm super excited. So. Thank you all <laughs> for your attention. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> interesting because I think I, I, I think poetry comics weirdly was like such a big pull for me um, and I, because they're so interested in being like beautiful and weird on the page but they're taking lines of poetry and putting them in speech bubbles and you know thought bubbles and whatever and everything just kind of like I, I don't know gets weird in interesting ways and so I am very inspired by um, poetry comics and I and as a fiction writer um, I, I think I, my writing was getting like shorter and shorter anyway, but man, this was a challenge. Like I would, I would write, for a while I would like type some of my phrases that I thought I would want, and when I went to letter it, it was like, oh my gosh, I can't fit half of this on the page. So I had to keep compressing and keep compressing and think about what work the image was doing versus what I was saying in, you know, in sentences. Um, to go back a little bit further, a lot of these ideas came from, like I was working out in essays. Um, um, I, I wrote an essay called The New Soccer Mom, thinking about like different generations in my history. It never got published, but a lot of the language is in here. Um, and, and another, yeah, other essays. So I had some language and I just had to keep distilling it down and distilling it down and then writing new language to go with it. But. Yeah, I I found that I, I would go back and forth. I would I would I I typed some notes. I would copy and paste things from um, from essays, but I pretty quickly realized I needed to bring them onto the page right away because and be thinking about layout and image at the same and. And, and then ultimately spreads, you know, like what two pages are gonna go together and what's, and so many times I would have, I'd mess up my pages somehow, like and I'd have to sort of make sure to add a transitional page or remove a page to make sure spreads worked. Um, but I, so yeah, I, I would bring it in onto my little Procreate page, some language, and then I would move it around. There's layers you, you can use, so I could move around the layer, I could, resize it, um, I could turn something long, I could kind of, you know, like make it more of a column. And I just kept playing around, playing around. Does that kind of get to it? Yeah. I know. 
I, I wrote a lot um, first. And I know, I mean, like I was just talking to a friend of mine who's working on a, a, his graphic memoir for publication. He's like, I've got the whole script like written out. I'm like, how do you do that? Because I, I really had to do it simultaneously. Like I had notes, I had some sections I knew I wanted to say, and then I would drop them in, and then, um, and and then yeah, and and then I and then I create from there. I I I never had a full script. The pages were always speaking to each other. I was always having to go back and forth. There was there was never this. There was never just a written. In a couple of interviews that I've done, uh, people have asked, like, do you do you write first or draw first, or do you think through writing or do you think through drawing or whatever? And I, I, I don't know. With this in particular, it really had to just be happening all at once. Like I had, I, yes, I had these pieces I'd written. Yes, I put them in, but I had to. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes, yeah, I, I, Linda Berry says just like the pen knows what to do, you know, like sometimes it's just like just hold the pen and like start moving and see what, and like see what words are coming out or drawings. I have to see, I had to see it with my handwriting. It was all hand lettered on the iPad, so digitally hand lettered, but um, yeah, I, but I had to, I had to even like see my handwriting to, to even know how it was going to feel on the page and like, yeah, so it really had to, I had to make it happen together, <laughs> which was tough. Yeah. Did you get any specific like archives to go in and find like, this historical documentation of like when sports emerged, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I yeah I, I kind of spared you all tonight all my research that I did, but I I did a kind of a deep dive into like. Uh, women's soccer history. I, I literally thought I was the beginning of women's soccer history. I thought my generation was like the first competitive women soccer players. But um, yeah, it turned out a hundred years ago in England the, were the lady footballers, um, and I was totally fascinated. So yeah, I, I, and I learned that through the research for the book. Um, so I have a whole yeah like row of books on. Um, on the lady footballers <laughs> of different, um, the Dick Kerr ladies were ones I got really excited about. They they were playing, it's kind of like a story like a league of their own, um, but it, it's in World War One in England and um, the men have gone off to war, the women go into the factories and then they start playing football, which is what everyone else calls soccer um <laughs> at out their breaks and then you know like one of the managers was like huh i bet we could make some money off of these women and um and they started playing in like charity games and playing in front of their, their first game their first match um on boxing day in 1917 was in front of 10,000 people i mean we can't hardly get 10,000 people to watch professional women play today so um, so that kind of geeked me out, and then by within four years, they were playing. They played in front of almost a million people over the course of 1921. Um, so guess what happens? The men are back from war. The women are really popular, and the English Football Association bans women from the sport, from any of their facilities, and they they call it. Um, they say that the the sport is unsuitable for females because of, you know, their delicate bodies um, and that sort of thing. So, so women got banned in 19, you know, just after like five years. So I got really geeked out about these stories. Um, and, and I met, there's, I, I, I met a guy on Twitter. Um, sounds weird, but, but um, you know, but there's, there's actually a bunch of people who like talk about the history on Twitter. And this one guy, he like found his granny's football memorabilia 
um, that had been up in an attic for years. He vaguely knew his granny played on the Dick Kerr ladies. This, they were named, by the way, after the um, after their munitions plant. It, that's why they're called the Dick Kerr ladies. It's kind of weird, but um, anyway. But his granny was one of them, and so he's been like t telling her story and doing a lot of research. And um, so I've been, so we've interacted, and he like let me use some of the images, um, and we've had a couple zooms, just like where he tells me more stuff. And, so, so all kind, yeah, just like books, internet, Twitter dudes. <laughs> yeah. There's like a follow-up question to that. that you engage a lot of history, different kinds of history, but there's also the narrative arc of, of Kelsey, right? Your narrative arc, and I was wondering how how did you like make those decisions of balancing those two things? Because I feel like the the book is incredibly well. -paid. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for saying nice things and, um, and for that question. Uh, yeah, that was a huge struggle. There was much more that I wanted to say and keep that um, that actually just my editor was like, no, <laughs> like, like no more. <laughs> um, she, you know, she would say like the pace gets a little slow here, or whatever, you know, or I would get too text heavy, and and I think even some pages are still. I mean. Are, are much more text heavy than others, but I tried to keep a balance. Um, I tried to just follow like what was most like exciting and interesting to me, and um, and like I figured if I was interested, maybe somebody else would be interested. Um, but yeah, but I did struggle with like yeah, where where to put the 1890s lady footballers versus the 19 teens lady footballers, and and I decided like like so the Dick Kerr ladies, I really liked transitioning. Like I don't know, it felt like a good organic transition to talk about them because they were, like, it was the 19 teens in England, and I had just declared myself in college a um, an English major after taking a British modernism class, and so I was talking about British modernism and how I was like, you know, pulled in by Virginia Woolf, and then this is the era. I mean, that's the era that they were playing in was the British modernist. I mean, era and location. So I thought, oh, what a perfect transition into the Dick Kerr ladies. So, um, so, and also it was like I was, I talked about myself for enough, enough for a couple chapters, so I was ready to like, kind of go back to the women. So, but I was thinking about stuff like that, just, you know, like, how spread out are they? Does it make sense, the transition? But I also wanted those to be chronological, and yeah, all of those questions <laughs> that we all have as writers, like, where to put anything. How much of anything is too much or not enough? Yeah. I have a kind of two-part question about like how you approach craft. Um, how do you determine when a project is finished, and then also how do you overcome the, uh, the pressure of making it perfect? Mm -hmm. like, how do you overcome perfectionism? Yeah, yeah. Um, the the one answer I have fits both of those, and that is like a drop dead deadline. <laughs> and I don't always have that. I mean, but um, but it's like I that was another like I, we 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 were trying to get this book out to make sure it was out in 2022, the 50th anniversary of Title IX, and um, and so there was some urgency there, and so. It's, it's one of those things where it's like, I spent as many hours as I would have spent on it if I'd taken three or five years, but I did it all in like a year and a half, you know I mean? It was like really compressed. And and then there were just things that was like, oh, I would, I would, I would like to make that better, but I'm gonna let, you know, I have to let that go. Um, but I don't, I mean, we don't all have deadlines in everything that we do all the time. So I think, um, you know, when I don't have a deadline like that, I, I do self-imposed deadlines, like, oh, I'm gonna submit it to this thing, or that thing, or, you know. Um, but working at the Rumpus, too, having those series where every, like, two to three weeks I had to, like, make a new eight to ten page comic, um, also was good training in both, like, getting it done and letting things go. I mean, I would also say that because I, I had already had not like success success as a writer like astronomical but I had but I felt like comfortable 
in my writing, like I liked my writing and I felt good about it and, and with who I was as a writer, um, I felt like it freed me up to not be so precious about my art making. And so, so, and, and also I like loose expressive art styles. Like I, I, I'd, I'd rather see someone's like, you know, blind contour, close their eyes, like see the energy of it than like a perfect, precise um, superhero. <laughs> Most of the time, I mean, so, I don't know. So I also just kind of tried to lean into like, what I liked. But I'm only moving because I'm getting this thing in my eye, like. Yeah.